The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome to the Women in Depth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Viado. Join me as we explore the inner lives of women, their struggles, fears, hopes, and dreams. We'll go beneath the surface and take a deeper look at what is hidden, unknown, uncertain, and uncomfortable. Hi, and welcome back. Today, I am really excited to be able to welcome back a previous guest, um, on women in depth and someone who I just feel is doing such meaningful and substantive work in the area of disordered eating. Jody Gale was with us on episode nine and the topic of that podcast episode was disordered eating, a search for wholeness. She is a soul centered psychotherapist, counselor and eating disorder specialist on the Northern beaches of Sydney. She's also the disordered eating consultant, trainer, and supervisor at Byron Private Holistic Treatment Center in Byron Bay, Australia. Jody has spent the last 20 plus years participating in workshops, training, and clinical supervision with some of the world's most influential thought leaders in the world of women's health and well being, complex trauma, and disordered eating. Highlights include workshops with Marion Woodman, Janine Roth, Dr. Anita Johnston, and most recently, a year-long training with Montanito founder Carolyn Costin. Jody regularly appears online, in print, and on national radio regarding her work with women and disordered eating. Her journey to becoming a therapist began with her own recovery from bulimia over 20 years ago. Welcome back, Jody. Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful, and I'm just really honored that you're back to share more of your insights and wisdom on, you know, this topic of weight discrimination, <laughs> which is very much, you know, connected to disordered eating. And I wanted to start, even though you shared this back in episode nine, with um, your own experience, and I was wondering if you could share about your own process and how it has led you to where you are now in the work that you're doing. Sure. So I suffered with bulimia from the age of 13 till I was 27. But prior to that, you know, really starting to worry about my weight from about five years old. And I remember that because it was my kindy school photo. And I remember wanting to stand next to the fat boy so that I didn't look fat. That was at five years old. So, you know, very, very long journey of being worried about my weight and then um, at about eight years old starting to, to diet and, and to hide my body. You know, we had a backyard swimming pool and I'd started to wear a T-shirt to sort of cover up my, my body in swimsuit and then went on to really chronic dieting, which was really the start of my eating disorder. I don't know if you remember it, but back in the 80s, there was a diet called the Beverly Hills Diet. And yeah, and it was very, very, very restrictive. And it was something like poor, poor, pineapple, poor, poor one day and then blueberries and rock melon the next day. And had been on that for something like two or three weeks and then ended up binging, which of course most people do who go on diets. And then thinking, how am I going to get rid of this food? And then coming up with this idea to have to purge my food. And at the time, I wasn't aware that that was actually an eating disorder because it was before it was sort of all in the news and everything. And then it wasn't, I think, until Princess Diana came on and talked about having bulimia. And I thought, oh, gosh, that's what I've got. Here I was thinking I'd come up with this fantastic idea. To <laughs> oh, and it was actually a very, very complex sickness. So then I spent most of my sort of teenage years and, and early adulthood with that and addiction and eventually found a, a wonderful therapist to help me recover. Now, you know, today we're, our topic is weight discrimination. Mm -hmm. How do you feel um, weight discrimination played into your experiences? Yeah, weight discrimination is external and internal. We internalize that sin ideal 
and then we start to weight discriminate against ourselves. But it's everywhere we go and it's disguised under the sort of health banner a lot of the time. I mean, if you look at what's out there at the moment in terms of the obesity sort of scaremongering and, you know, those sort of get healthy, get fit sort of programs, it's usually the medical and the fitness industry that sort of perpetuate all this stuff. There's this sort of big sort of banner that says in order to be healthy you have to be at a certain weight and that's just not true so if I look back to my own childhood I I don't think it was that sort of advanced thinking back then but you know magazines had sort of all just sort of started to put supermodels on the cover and I know that you know there's a history in my family around um dieting I mean my father was a musician so I suspect that he was always trying to look good for being on stage and my mother worked in a in a figure clinic where people were um, obviously there trying to, to look a certain way so it was certainly prevalent back then but it's it's sort of got worse as the years have gone by and if, if you look at you know over the years more and more focus on weight and yet there's more eating disorders and then there's more obesity. So there's something wrong in the message that it's all about weight. And so it doesn't matter where you go, you can go to the doctor. I mean, I've heard of clients say they've been to the doctor for a pap smear and they've come out being given a a diet. They went to get their Invisalign braces fitted and were told, oh, ha, 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 you might lose some weight. Um, You go to the gym and actually at my gym, there's a big sign on the wall that says excessive exercise will make you look better or something like that. So, (laughs) yes, it's terrible. I keep meaning to complain about it. But um, And even with therapists, actually, you know, I have been in therapy before where the therapist is kind of colluded with needing to lose weight and a lot of people in therapy who are in a big body say that that's often the case you know they've been given paleo diets by their therapist and all sorts of things so it's sort of insidious and it's everywhere it's particularly problematic for people who are in a bigger body and and maybe people have got they're pre-diabetic or they've got diabetes the first thing they're told is to lose weight and Research shows that something like at least 30% of people in diet programs have been eating disorder. So what's happening is that they're being told to lose weight, but they're not actually being uh, questioned about whether they have any eating concerns. Yeah, it's just assumed that they're fat, lazy, can't control their food, that obviously if you're in a bigger body, you're not taking care of yourself in some way. But the minute these people are put on diets if they do have that underlying eating disorder there's a whole other world of problems that then start to emerge because they start on that chronic restrict binge pattern again which actually makes them end up putting on more weight it's just like the assumptions of healthy equals thin yeah thin equals that you are productive and active also means healthy yep. and then and then yep. the opposite of that is if you are fat you must be lazy and unhealthy. Yeah, that's correct. And then the solution to all of this is for you to lose weight. Lose weight. I'm the perfect <laughs> example of how this isn't true. When I was, I was very, very underweight in my 20s when I was with my eating disorder. But I was, you know, I had bulimia. So I was binging and purging many, many times a day. I was chronically restricting. I lived on diet, um, cherry coke and cigarettes and speed. <sighs> and... I was, you know, very, very thin. I used to get mistaken for being a model. I went to do hair somewhere and they said, um, oh, are you one of the models? You know, so um, here I was with all these sort of issues going on, but it was never detected by the doctors because I looked okay. Jump forward 20 years in a bigger body and, you know, healthy, swimming. I mean, I swim most days. I go to the gym. I eat a, you know, predominantly vegetarian diet and, you know, had a bit of a sweet drink sort of issue going on, but I let go (laughs) of that now. Um, You know, not perfect, but a much healthier life, a mother, relationships, friends, all sorts of things. So you can, once people get to the extremes, you know, someone who is in a very, very, very underweight body who, you know, through something like anorexia, of course, this person is not healthy. Likewise, with extreme, you know, extreme overweight, you know, we're not talking about that end of the scale. We're talking about everything else in between. So, And so you mentioned this internal process, and I feel that 
that's actually the process that we have some control over, that we can impact. Oh, absolutely. And part of the work in terms of recovering, whether it's from chronic dieting or orthorexia or, or, or disordered eating, is around really coming to terms with the fact that you are going to have to live in a world where you're going to be triggered by this stuff every single day. So part of that is really around how you begin to, in therapy, we sort of work to separate out from those internalized messages, whether it be from family, culture, from, you know, that which we're seeing on Instagram and things like, you know, the external fat shaming. And I mean, you see it online all the time. People feel it's completely okay to fat shame other people and how we then stop to fat shame ourselves. So it's really around working with someone to begin to take care of themselves to focus on their health and to really change up that thinking and really challenging where does this thought come from where where does this belief come from and historically I used to use other countries around the world to sort of do that you know look at people in this country or that country but since the widespread use of the internet you know there's a study in Fiji where people after a couple of years of having TV and internet actually started to have weight issues as well. So it really is sort of a global problem. So it's working internally and changing one's perception of oneself and really beginning to look at, I guess one of the ways I do that is to separate, um, not separate from the body, but to see that I have a body, but I'm also more than my body. And, um, you know, there's this whole other rich world inside of us called the soul and to really begin to focus on that. And you mentioned this also when, um, when we spoke before about the recovery process is the journey of the soul. Yes, absolutely. And it's helping people realize you are so much more than a photoshopped image on Instagram. I mean, when you say it like that, it's kind of crazy really that people are missing this whole inner world of themselves this deep rich inner life exactly like the topics that you talk about on your podcast really and to really turn the focus inwards to this um and it's in my latest training that I've done with Carolyn Coston she calls it the soul self and to really begin to focus on this aspect of our lives and what does the soul call for what is the soul really hungry for you should speak of what is the soul hungry for. It just reminded me of Dr. Anita Johnston's work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And what our hunger and what we hunger for can symbolize, you know, and the meaning behind that. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, if you think about even sort of focusing on weight loss, I mean, what is this person actually seeking to actualize? And usually it's to do with worth, success, good enough. And what we know is that all these things are an inside job. It doesn't matter how much weight you lose, what you look like. If you're not doing that inner work, it won't sort of match up. And I think people find that too. If they have lost a lot of weight, if they haven't done that internal work, they're, um, they're still miserable inside, you know, they're still living a miserable life. So in sort of eating psychology, we talk about starting to live the life that you, you know, if I'm thinking, oh, if I'm thin, I'll do this or I'll wear this or I'll get a boyfriend or whatever it is that we're telling ourselves, start to live that life today without focusing on the weight. So how can I bring more of whatever it is that I'm longing for into my life right now? and living from that place rather than waiting. I mean, you could be waiting your whole life and especially people who restrict binge, restrict binge, restrict binge. I mean, it's never ending. So why not start to live the life that you want right now? That is connected to that, the piece of the acceptance. It's acceptance, but that of course will include body acceptance. Yes, absolutely. And size acceptance, you know, if we're talking about weight discrimination, it's, um, it's because of the complete lack of size diversity as well. You only have to look in magazines and, you know, online 
articles and whatever else to see that there is very little size diversity although you know in the last couple of years I have noticed a little bit of a shift in that but again when there has been size diversity I think we messaged each other about that Tess Holiday cover of Cosmopolitan yes, the yes. outrage the world was in absolute <laughs> outrage that could put someone in a fat body on the cover of a magazine so you know we still have a very very long way to go one of the problems with that is, you know, they were sort of saying, how dare you put a fat person on the cover? You're promoting obesity. And even people were just up in arms about it. It's crazy, really. So, yeah, we've got a long way to go. I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more about what disordered eating is. You're experiencing disordered eating way mm. before you're diagnosable. <laughs> you oh, know? yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah, so, so I, like you described, you know, when you were five, just, you know, just yep. this. Yeah. So if you could. Yeah. Okay. So an eating disorder doesn't just develop overnight. You will have disordered eating before, absolutely, before you get diagnosed with an eating disorder. So I would call this chronic dieting as disordered eating. You know, people who are always on diets, people who are living under this healthy eating banner, but are actually restricting. So people who maybe go to the gym, not because it's good for their bodies or because they're doing some self-care, you know, you can go to the gym and sort of say, oh, wow, this is a really good part of my self-care routine. I really enjoy this. For me, I love going to spin class because in my 20s, I used to go clubbing quite a lot in London and the uh, spin class plays really great techno music. So I really <laughs> love that. Class. I love that. It's German and it's really like hard house and oh yeah. my God, I love this. You know, I'm too old to go clubbing. <laughs> sort of thing but um that's a healthy attitude people who go and you know to take care of themselves but if you start getting to the point where you are missing out on social experiences because of orthorexia is very big at the moment and clean eating or because you're going to the gym so you might say okay all my friends are going out on saturday night but i can't go because there's nothing there that's clean for me to eat they might use fat they might do this and then the gym side of things, you know, I'll, I'll miss out on social situations because I can't miss a day at the gym. If I miss a day, I might get fat. So these kind of things that have crept their way into everyday life, they used to be just sort of in the domain of classic eating disorders, but I'm noticing the last sort of 10 years, more and more everyday people are getting caught into this stuff. It's normal to overeat sometimes. It's normal to undereat sometimes. You know, when you go on holidays, I mean, I know we've been on a couple of family cruises. And of course, when you go on a holiday, you're going to eat a little bit more than what you normally do. It's not an excuse to binge on holiday. If you're doing that, then that's different. And what you will find is that people will diet, 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 diet before the holiday, and then they will binge on the holiday. That's disordered. Eating a little bit more on holiday because you're relaxed, you're having some cocktails, you know, you're sort of yeah. eating out a lot more than you normally would. That's normal. There's no need to then when you get back, go into restricting again. It's like, okay, I had a great holiday. need to get back on track, you know, yeah. going to the gym um, in a sort of more casual kind of way. Even something that seems more innocuous, whereas, you know, if you choose to, to not go to the gym, you know, feeling shame, like, you know, I didn't work out today or not being able to enjoy what you would consider a bad food because while you're eating it, you're feeling bad for, you know, having a cheeseburger or yes. eating well, a bag of chips. And that's that you've, you've raised a really good topic there. This idea that food is good or bad. Yeah. And it's like, I, I said to my daughters at school, my daughter's nine, there's girls starting to fat talk in her year. And that started from last year, which was year two. So she was eight at the time. And she'd overheard a conversation between two girls saying, oh, my mum's fat. And then the other girl said, oh, my mum's fat too. Wow. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And what oh did my you gosh. say? And she said, I didn't say anything. She said, I felt very, very sad because obviously we do a lot of work around <laughs> preventing this at home. Yeah. So I was having a bit of a hashtag good mother moment in that moment where uh, she said, I felt very, very sad because firstly, their mums aren't fat. Secondly, it's not a crime to be fat. And oh, thirdly, I didn't wow. think uh, Amy was being her true self. She was just saying that to fit in with the other one. Oh, wow. Name, 
<laughs> and then what's also happening is they're starting to talk about this good and bad foods at school. And so I had a conversation with both of my kids last week saying, they said, so what's healthy? And I said, well, everything is healthy in moderation. So if you only lived on carrots, you would be unhealthy. Yeah, if you only right. lived on cheeseburgers, you would be unhealthy. Somewhere in the middle is a really good place to be. Again, as we were talking about before, the messages that are coming in from all directions of, you know, you want to eat healthy and suddenly healthy eating puts food in categories, good or bad. That's right. That's right. And I actually spoke to the school. I was wondering, what do you teach in your PDHP here? And they actually said, no, we don't teach healthy, unhealthy. We actually teach sometimes and everyday foods. And I was like, oh, perfect. That's sort of, you know, what I would recommend. But that's right. You know, what happens is there's a judgment around a cheeseburger being bad. And when you pull it apart, it's two pieces of bread, some meat and some cheese and some sauce and some onion. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually not bad. It's just food. If you lived on cheeseburgers, it wouldn't be very good for you. Of course not. It's going to be very unhealthy. So we really need to lose this good, bad, healthy, unhealthy. Clean, well, I don't know what the opposite right. is. To clean eating. Is it dirty eating? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. when, when you put it like that, it kind of has to be, you know? Well, you know, it, it polarizes. Um, it does. It does. And, and with this polarization, we also polarize ourselves because if I am eating a bad food, I'm a bad, you know, person. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's the judgment that's put on the food. And then, you know, once I've ingested this, then I become bad. And what we talk about, which obviously you will know about in psychology is around splitting. And yeah. it's that black and white thinking that splitting good, bad, very, very dangerous for the psyche, you know, yeah. to be seeing oneself in such a way. Well, you know, it sets you up again, you know, you had mentioned this internal process and it sets you up against yourself and that you are now rejecting a part of yourself. That's the bad self. I don't want that self. Yes. Even in my um, Carolyn Coston training, we talk about the two. I mean, I work in more parts than this. As I think you remember from last time I talked about subpersonality. So, yeah. but in this training, we talk about the healthy self and the soul self and then the eating disorder self. And even in terms of recovering, we don't get rid of the eating disorder self. We work to integrate that back in to our wholeness. So we don't even see that as a bad self. We see it as a, this is a part of us that has had to use a whole set of behaviors in order to get sort of needs met in some way. Obviously that's gone haywire. And then we work to integrate that back in. So finding out what those needs are and how another that's way right. those needs can be met and maybe even how those needs began, how they were lost or how they um, have gotten to this point where they are just starving for something. Yes, exactly. Exactly that. And I think what you're also saying too right now, it made me think about, you know, something that's very common with disordered eating is not knowing how you feel or what you want to eat, not even exactly. being able to tell if you're hungry. Yeah. And because what ends up happening is it's this external that tells you what to eat, what not to eat, when to eat. And so you lose touch with that inner part of you that is very wise and knows that. Yeah, that's right. And um, one of the things we talk about as a Carolyn Costum coach is that we don't really start off by trying to get people to eat intuitively. It's more conscious eating, which may involve intuitive eating at some point. But when someone's system is so out of whack, you say to them, right, go and do intuitive eating or mindful eating. It's like, well, what the hell's that? Like, you know, <laughs> right. I, can't, I can't tell when I'm hungry, not hungry. Um, <laughs> and also if you've been restricting, eating half a sandwich is going to feel like 50 sandwiches because your stomach has sort of shrunk and, and all the stuff going on in your thoughts at the same time. So I guess if you're struggling with this and you can't mindful eat, I'm not surprised, you know, it takes a lot of time to get things back on track. So part of that would be for me, when I, when I had bulimia, I, I followed a meal plan for a while and, you know, some people are quite against these, but for me, it was like, okay, this is what 
people with normal attitudes around food actually eat. So I'll try and aim towards towards that. And then gradually over time, listening to your body, you can, oh, okay, that actually didn't feel so bad. I could have that again. And, you know, you're gradually building up to becoming more mindful, but it's not something that just happens overnight. You know, I'm really glad that you're, you're sharing this because I can relate to that. When I yep. first started to try the intuitive eating it was very hard for me to access. And, you know, then I started wondering something wrong with me. Am I doing this wrong? But I love that, you know, you describing it as um, conscious eating, which just starting to pay attention. Yes, that's right. You know, being mindful instead of um, not really thinking about what you're eating, when you're eating, the amounts you're eating, because it's almost like you go into this state of numbness or, you know, being asleep when you're eating. And so, Really, even when you're eating, just eating, you know, not doing anything else and being engaged with your food and that meal. Yes, that's right. And it's really just around raising your awareness about what is going on with your food in that moment. So in terms of being conscious of your hunger, eating regularly, um, allowing yourself to eat all foods, unless, of course, you're allergic or have something like diabetes And, you know, not getting hung up on calories and carb counting. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in, you know, in terms of that. So, So, Jody, what would be your, I guess, your words of wisdom for someone who is resonating with our conversation today and not really knowing how to begin the process of recovery? Okay, so I guess I want to come back to that, how we see ourselves and really beginning to think about looking at ourselves in in two directions that I I have a an ego and a personality and I also have a um, have a soul and a spiritual self and to really look inwards to that self it's kind of like looking back at a baby I guess and sort of thinking would I look at this baby and call her fat you know what I look at this baby and say you can't eat that you're blah 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 and of course you know there's of course there's foods we don't give babies but or even a child you know would I antagonize a child and tyrannize a child the way I'm tyrannizing myself and of course you wouldn't so it's looking to that inside to that part of us and having compassion for ourselves and looking inwards to that child and and really taking care of that child and part of that would also be self-care so if I think about how I take care of my children you know I make sure they eat Uh, regularly I make sure they have lots of veggies fruits Um, we include fun foods we do go out to McDonald's occasionally we go for big long walks you know if for example had an overweight child a lot of people are putting them on diets and trying to get them not to be obese I would say put your phones down and spend time having family dinners and you know like going for long walks together going for bike rides and treating ourselves in that way you want to be healthy, but not being so rigid and controlling and, and really befriending the body. So mm-hmm. working towards size diversity, that it's, it's okay that my body is a, is a, um, is, is a different size. They, bodies come in all different shapes and sizes. It's not, it's not fat shaming other people or being discriminatory. You know, people are making fat jokes. It's really sort of standing up to people when they do that and ultimately focusing on health rather than size. And, and that can be at any size, you know, even in a, in a thin body, are you really taking care of your health? If you're in a fat body, are you really taking care of your health? You know, if you're getting sore ankles or sore knees or whatever, then maybe you are carrying a little bit too much weight. But then the focus is still on health, not going on a diet. Right. So, so eating, you know, the foods that are going to really give your body the nutrients needs exactly water exactly getting enough sleep exactly sleep's very important very important i was thinking about um you know that the polarity of uh good and bad i was imagining that you know like a like a long line with the opposing sides and really it becomes that everything on that continuum is allowed yes absolutely and every expression of that is allowed and really what it is is being making healthy choices that nurture your body I think that has to be the qualifier because oftentimes the healthy choices can actually be harmful, you know, like over exercising. Yeah. I mean, you only have to look at orthorexia to see that, you know, it's, um, 
you know, can't have anything with fat or anything with carbohydrates or whatever it is. So, and again, you know, going back to food, it's about having, you know, I take a very old fashioned view about what we should be eating. And that's really going back to sort of that healthy eating plate where you have half a plate of veggies or salad, some, a quarter of the plate of protein and a quarter of the plate of carbohydrate. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit more, sometimes it's going to be a little bit less, but it's really looking at the whole five food groups as well rather than cutting out sort of macronutrients like, you know, you want a good balance of macronutrients like carbohydrate, protein and fats and a little bit of everything else, you know, so it's very, very balanced. The other thing that I would say too is in terms of, you know, at home is things like throwing out the scales. There is absolutely no need to keep scales in your house. My experience is that all they do is serve to make people feel bad. It's like the external judge, particularly if you've got children. Um, I mean, I've just asked a family member to get rid of theirs from home. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and I said, you know, the kids are coming around. Can you ditch the scales? Um, yeah, and just leading a healthy, active life, you know, a big life. And if you are in a big body, you know, someone once said to me, you've got a big personality, you live a big life. And I kind of thought, oh, yeah, I do too. I hadn't really thought of it like that, you know. <laughs> live a big life regardless of what kind of body you're in, you know. Yeah, live a big life. Because I think what happens is our lives become smaller, Yeah, you know, right, in proportion yep. to what we perceive as um, absolutely our fat bodies and i i'm really glad you mentioned that too about the the scales and looking at your plate and having you know veggies having proteins carbohydrates because again i think just like with the scales when you start to get into this measuring and this mm -hmm. you know i need to have this many ounces this many carbs the carbs have to come from here that leads right into the disordered eating um, oh, absolutely you're having to meet this you know, the standard, this, and it's measured. Well, what, what we would say, eating psychology uh, with Mark David and Emily Rosen is that those numbers and, you know, focusing on carb counting, calorie counting, the number on the scale, how long you exercise for, we would say that that's very masculine way of um, viewing oneself and that we need to, an unhealthy masculine, and that we need to bring in more of the feminine in terms of moving the body in ways that you love, nourishing yourself, like becoming the nourishing mother to yourself and nourishing yourself with food rather than restricting and being punitive towards yourself. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that again, like the masculine, and the feminine balance here, the energies of being open and flexible and accepting versus the rigidity and the conditions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Jody, I know that you have a lot of offerings for those who might be interested in working with you. Also, you have um, some projects that are in the process. <laughs> and so if you could share, um, you know, where listeners can find you and learn more about you and possibly work with you. Yeah, sure. So I work in private practice on the northern beaches of Sydney. My practice is actually full at the moment, but I do, I've created some space for some, because I work mostly long term with people. So when I became a mother, I decided that I uh, wanted to keep Saturday afternoons free, but occasionally I run some soul sessions. So they're individual. So it's between one and six weeks and I do those via Skype as well as in person. So that's basically where we do a creative visualization and do a little bit of art therapy and things like that. So I offer those and since our last interview, I'm still writing my <laughs> ebook. <laughs> I have been so busy. <laughs> I train I think the first year after we spoke, I trained to become a supervisor, clinical supervisor. So I'm supervising people who work with people with eating disorders. And then I went on to do the Carolyn Coston training. So I, I kind of got put to the side. But if you join my mailing list, you will be the first to receive a copy when it's finished. <laughs> Hopefully early next year. <laughs> Oh, Jody, thank you so much for coming back and, you know, having this conversation with me today. It's, I feel that um, it's even more important than ever, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I love your podcast. I listen every episode. So thank you. Good to see you again. Take care.
Thanks so much for listening to the Women in Depth podcast. I hope it brings you a deeper understanding of yourself and others, and that you found some insights that illuminated and inspired. You can follow Women in Depth on Facebook and YouTube, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. And finally, if you enjoy Women in Depth, please share with a friend. Again, thank you so much for listening, and see you next time.